Hello everyone, I hope you are enjoying the series so far and I'm back with another episode of More Than. A couple of weeks back during lockdown I had the opportunity to speak to England and Aston Villa defender Tyrone Mings. Tyrone has a very interesting story to tell and I thought it was great for me to explore not only his career in football but I also found out about more about his businesses away from football. To keep up to date with all the past and future podcasts, subscribe on YouTube, Spotify and iTunes. Hope you enjoy. So hey everyone, I'm here with Tyrone Mings from um, Aston Villa. Welcome bro. How's it been like mentally for you? Have you got, um, you know, is there any new habits that you have like added to your routine? Any new skills? Is there anything that, you know, you've probably discovered that you didn't know about yourself and you're like, yo, I need to still... Like I need to do this more or something. Like, has it changed you in some way, quarantine? Um, I mean, I do like reading, but but there's only so much reading you can do uh, when when you're in quarantine and, and bored. So uh, I've bought I've bought a fair few things, and some of them I've not got used. Like, I'm, <laughs> like I bought a dartboard, thinking yeah, that will keep me entertained. Not take <laughs> you couldn't go to the pub, so you brought the pub at home, huh? <laughs> I'm telling you, but I've not bought, I've not taken out the box yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm not taking out the box. I bought a piano and I've tried to learn that and I really enjoy learning that, but that is oh, so it. difficult. So difficult. Oh I, my I god. Tried a couple of times as well, and it's like the first couple of weeks, you feel like you get it easy, mm. but then when you start into chords right and left, and it's like, whoa, this is too much. Yeah. I use an app called Simply Piano, I think it's called. Yeah, you, I think I've tried it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good. It's good, right? But, but like, they'll, they'll teach you something real basic. And I'm like, yeah, that's fairly easy. And then, bang, they just chuck you into a song. And it's that <laughs> <Just> quick. <laughs> <laughs> but, nah, it's tough. But saying that, it's been, it's been rewarding in terms of, like, when you immerse yourself in football day in, day out, I think, it's rewarding and it's humbling to go back to something that you don't know anything about and try and learn about and try and um, further your further your knowledge and broaden your horizons in terms of what else there is out there. Because sometimes yeah. we get labelled as footballers and that's all that we should be doing. And I think that's sometimes mentally unstable. And so I've really enjoyed it. Uh, like I said, the dartboard hasn't been out of the box. I bought a couple of bikes. I've really enjoyed riding. Uh, but I think I'm probably I'm probably in the I'm probably in the majority of the country who have taken up something new, thinking yeah. full well that they're going to continue it when when the world goes back to normal when they go back to work. But I think I'm I not think sure how sustainable ride, it is. The bike ride thing is something that's really really like brought me joy when I've been in quarantine, man. Also, like I live in the countryside, so I got a bike as well. And like I don't know, almost like two three times a week in the afternoon, I used to go at like seven eight o'clock golden hour, yeah. you know. <laughs> go for a ride a couple of hours and it made me feel so good man and i i hope that when games come back i'm not too tired to not do it you know because <laughs> it's yeah, but so good at least you know in the summer you've got something that, yeah, that you enjoy doing because running is so boring in the summer i know i know i know, I know. <laughs> so bro um a lot of people have seen some of your interviews and stuff and i think out of the footballers that i know you probably have one of the most interesting upbringings and start mm. to their careers. So um, yeah, just take me, take me through it and take everyone through like, um, you know, your early days with your mom and then, uh, you know, starting football and, uh, you know, trialing at different teams. Like how, how was, how did Taro Mings get to, to where he is today? Boy, I don't even know where to start. I'm <laughs> honest. I I could sit here and take up the whole podcast talking about uh, I getting to this stage today. But you know what? I, I've, I've spoken about this at length before and I think I, I wouldn't change my story uh, or my upbringing or background or early start in football for anything just because I think I've experienced so much. And when we get out of playing football and when we retire, I think um, – Hopefully it stands me in, in good stead for knowing what's on the other side and knowing uh, what's to come and what the real world is like. So, yeah, obviously I started at Southampton um, from 7 to 15, 16 and really enjoyed my time there. I, I used to train down in Bath. So rather than travelling down to Southampton, if you lived closer to Bath, they had like a satellite centre and you could you could just train there. And We had a real good core of, of players down there. Like um, Lloyd Isgrove is now at... 
at Swindon, I think. Uh, but he came up through the academy. Nathan Dyer was there. Um, Thea Walcott was there. Gareth Bale was there. So we had a real... Granted, they were at different age groups, but because there were so few of us, we all used to train together. And mm -hmm. it gave me a real good insight to working with really good players and, and top quality players. And um, I kind of knew when I was getting to 16, obviously you played with Ox. When I was getting to 16, me and him were the only two that had to play for the under 15s when we were under 16s because we weren't big enough. And uh, I mean, ironically, we were the only two that have gone on to play in the Premier League from that age group. Funny. Um, it's just strange sometimes how football works. I think in this country, obviously, you had a slightly different culture and, and where you grew up, but in this country, everything is about size and results in the academy and stuff. So it was unfortunate that, that I got released when I did for the reasons that I did. But at the same time, I took a slightly different path and I don't I don't regret what happened because they had their reasons for it. But when I got released, yeah, that was that was a strange time because I went you name it, I went there on trial and everybody was saying the same thing that uh we've got our scholars for this year and um we don't really need anyone else and you're a little bit small and we don't really have the budget. Like I went everywhere, Cardiff, Bristol Rovers, Swindon, Chelsea, Portsmouth, at like mm -hmm. And I think my mum wrote to, I think my mum wrote a letter to every football league club at the time, like seventy two clubs, and was and they were. I think we only got a reply from like four or five, and they were like, "Sorry, like um, we don't have any space for him." Blah blah blah. I wish him all the best. And I mean, sometimes I look at them letters and I'm like, "You could have saved yourself so much money." <laughs> you just said, "Yeah, that could have done." But but I left I left Samanda with no regrets. Um, and I basically just went back to school. I went to school for sixth form, so from 16 to 18, and I was lucky enough to get a sports scholarship at a, a private school. Mm -hmm. And I went there for two years, and that allowed me to kind of work on my size and my speed and my physicality away from um, the professional world. Like football so, then? Like yeah, so person? yeah, it was a football scholarship. So I was, we were playing, we played against Hampton actually in the game. Um, it was quite a good school so we played against quite good teams and we had quite a comprehensive football program so like Mondays and Tuesdays we used to do gym and we used to train every day uh, so it was kind of like playing football but still at school yeah um, so you're learning that was good yeah like, that's what I mean yeah you were still like training every day or every week yeah yeah environment. yeah and I think that really helped because when I when I joined the school I was about 5'10 and I left the school when I was 6 foot 3 and I was in the space of a couple of years. Or there, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's any small players out there, I recommend you go there. Because the food's good, clearly. But nah, it, it was it was a good experience for me. And I came out of there really in no better position in terms of breaking into the football game because I didn't have a club to go to. I didn't have um, any hopes or dreams or, or idea of where I was going to go next. And... I just went and worked in a pub and I went and played local football and I used to get paid like I think £45 a week and then I was like getting the train to work and then working and then my mate would give me a lift to training and then I would get back from training and get a train home and then walk back home and I was like leaving the house at 7 in the morning getting back at like 11. I was like I did that for a year and I thought this isn't sustainable like, I'm, I'm, I'm earning more money in my job than I am playing football. So why am I, why would I continue to, to do all this for 45 pound a week? Wow. And I thought, I'm not sure how much longer I can do this. And then it got to the summer and I passed my driving test and that was kind of the turning point for me. But I went on, I went on trial at Hereford when this was like a year after I left school, I went on trial at Hereford for about two weeks. And they really wanted to sign me, but they were under a transfer embargo because they hadn't paid their, their VAT bill or something. So they couldn't sign me. They were in the conference at the time. And then it was about six weeks later, I went to Ipswich on trial, um, just through chance, really. Their under 18s manager, his son played in the same local team as me. So he was like, you can come up here and trial. And, and then Mick McCarthy came over and watched the game. And from there, he just said, yeah, I'll sign it. And I was... I I was on less money as a, as a second choice left back in the championship as what I was in my mortgage advising job. So I was thinking, hang on a minute. I thought, 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 thought we're going to earn loads of money. 
<laughs> but, uh, I thought, but he was the manager was good. He was like, "I'll give you an eighteen month contract. Here's what I'm going to offer you. You can either take it or leave it. And if it works out, great. If it doesn't, then it doesn't really cost the club much money." I thought, "Well, what a way to make a feel um, a guy feel wanted." <laughs> but... <laughs> give you all the confidence you need, it right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But now, uh, yeah, and then from there, obviously, my career. Um, Took off really. I, Aaron Cresswell played left back whilst I was there for a year and a half. So I, I was just playing behind him, playing when he was injured, playing when he was suspended, stuff like that. And then when he left and went to West Ham, I played for one season at left back. And, uh, and then at the end of the season, we got into the playoffs but lost and Bournemouth got promoted and yeah, they signed me. So, I mean, the early days, early days, that was the touching on it. It was just. It was just strange. And I think sometimes I look back and I think there's so many players that get released from academies and never get a chance to get back into football or never get another opportunity. So I feel so fortunate enough to, to we've I've got the opportunity. I mean, from there, um, obviously, a lot of hard work, patience, setbacks, dedication and everything that comes with um, trying to get to the top. And it just never it just never stops. I think people people don't also understand that about people's careers that there's always new things you want to do there's always other goals like yeah. you would have you would have had goals before your injury and then the injury kind of resets that and it's like wow I'm just fortunate enough to be in this position let me just get fit again and then from there I'll go again but there's the disappointment and the ups and downs just never stops whether you're playing yeah. or whether you're not I feel like people think like the the career of an athlete is always like that, right? And it's mm. literally like the other way around. It's like ups and downs in every like mm. corner you turn. Day to day as well. Like yeah. day to day it's like that. It's not It's not just like, oh, the only setback could be an injury. Like the amount of conversations you have with the club, with players, with your family, with like in, what's going on in your personal life. Like I did an interview recently talking about um, – how people don't care about what happens Monday to Friday because whatever does happen, whether you got whether someone passed away or someone's ill, or you split up with someone, or something's happening with your family, you have to come Saturday at three o'clock. You have to park that because nobody like cares. nothing happened, right? No, you only get judged on ninety minutes and how you play in that, and that is how your career is defined, which is right because obviously that's why that's why we're employed by the club. But at the same time, it's mentally sometimes it can be quite unstable i think yeah do you think do you think football are doing are doing enough in that in that sense i mean i, I feel like in the past few years there's been like a lot of awareness that's been raised uh, in mental health um uh, with uh, i think aaron lennon was one of the first few players that mm. came out there, uh, danny rose um do you feel that there's still like a good enough infra infrastructure or like a good enough safe space um, for players to, to talk about this stuff? Yeah, it's a good question because I think th there's, a, there's a bit of a stigma and a, and a worry attached with, an out with um, saying that you've got something wrong with you because every player wants to play and every player thinks that whatever happens Monday to Friday, oh, come Saturday, I'll be fine. And, and I think the last few years, definitely there's been a lot more emphasis in trying to be um, conscious of it and trying to bring it to people's minds and people trying to be aware of um, the fact that players are still human and we go through ups and downs and I think it, it, it's unfortunate that a lot of the players speaking out about it have been ex-players because I think that shows that it's still uh, quite difficult to approach your manager or club and say yeah I'm really struggling because like, some players can be coming towards the end of a contract and trying to get a new one or some club, some players will be will be um, playing really well, but Monday to Friday, they feel really crap. So I think there's a lot of different things to consider in terms of whether you speak out or whether you don't. Uh, um, but I think the sport itself has a lot of good partners to it, whether they be like charities or um, different organisations that, that try and help. But I think sometimes, well, the majority of the time, it just has to come from the player and the player has to know... Um, at his club that like if he speaks out he will be supported and not kind of be made a villain yeah no for real I think I think like obviously there's so many campaigns and so many things like that but I think internally is where it matters the most you know that mm. for the player to know that you know the coach is not going to judge you 
on how mm. your you say like your Monday to Friday is, you know, as long as you're performing and as long as you're doing well, your coach should be there. You know, it should be a safe space for you to like talk to him and be like, I'm having this problem. Can the club help me? Or is there anyone that can help me? But that doesn't mean, you know, that you won't perform or you're not in, in, in that place. As you say, you can be very bad and then you can be performing really well. But it, yeah. it, it, and that, um, I feel like, as you say, we're humans, you know, we're not machines. We're judging these 90 minutes, but there's so, so many things happening in our lives. Like they are in everyone's lives. But um, obviously, they're not um, scrutinized for 90 minutes every every week, and 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 it doesn't. There's not like this spotlight on their life as well, because I feel like people want to know also, you know, what's yeah, yeah, yeah. happening to them here. They bought this car, they did this and did that, and um, you know, probably someone doesn't want people to know what is what is happening or what it, what is he's going through or not. Um, but I found that. Um, you know, since the club, for example, at Arsenal, uh, there's been a, a better infrastructure and there's been like um, a more more trust and more of a safe space with the coaches. I think people are starting to come forward and say like, oh, I'm going through this. Like, and I think the club is is uh, offering a lot of, of help. So yeah, I feel like the campaigns are good, you know, but it, it has to be at the core of the club, especially for the players. Yeah, definitely. I think the campaigns are almost more for the fans, aren't they? To, yeah. to, 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 to know that um, it is okay. And obviously sport has such a big reach and such a big platform that we can affect a lot of people's lives. And if we're talking about it in sport, fans and everyone associated with football, with the football club, will also feel um, that it's okay to speak out. But in terms of, like you just said about speaking out and, and players doing it, I think, yeah, definitely it's a club-by-club -club basis because... Um, different organisations within football can be doing as much great work as they can but if it's not filtered through to the club or if your manager doesn't really understand mental health or yeah. uh, stuff like that then I think yeah it's definitely a club by club thing but I think in the main it's moving in the in the right direction but like everything it just it just it takes a while takes a right? it takes a long time yeah definitely but I think I think yeah I think like now with the FA Cup as well uh, then the uh, heads up for FA Cup uh, yeah yeah I think, yeah, they're definitely great initiatives, man. And, you know, they can get people talking more because sometimes, I mean, um, I heard that you've like uh, used therapy as well uh, outside of football. Mm. I've done the same for me. It's been like so important in my life, not just like with football, but also outside of it. And mm. um, yeah, I think sometimes just having that conversation can solve so many questions, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I speak to someone before every game Mm -hmm. um so like we have like a, a like a routine that we go through before a game mm -hmm. um it usually is about two two hours three hours before kickoff uh because in the morning of the game i don't like speaking to anyone so i just play music as, as loud as i can and I just yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of i just enjoy myself for the morning because i think any negative energy that you have it kind of releases with music uh -huh. um and yeah, throughout the week we speak about different topics and like you said, football, non-football and, and and that is family is great, friends are great, the club is great, but sometimes you just want someone who you know is not going to judge you and sometimes yeah. you have um, other people have things going on in their life so you don't want to put the pressures or the worries or the stresses on them as well. So I think um, it's one of the best things that I've done and I, I started using him when I got injured at Bournemouth. So we're talking like five years ago, I've been yeah. using him. And, and um, yeah, it's no coincidence now that I feel more settled mentally. I feel uh, that I'm better prepared to deal with setbacks. And um, I'm also more aware of my surroundings. I'm more aware of things that are happening in football. And, and sometimes like, it's very easy to be quite emotional in football and you want to go and knock the manager's door or, you want to have a tear up with your with your with, with your with your teammates if something's not going right on the pitch or on the training pitch or fans are accusing you of this and commenting on this and sometimes yeah. that there's so many different influences that could change your mentality or your your happiness that yeah. I think I've learned to deal with that better over the years and that's not that's not by coincidence that's by speaking to someone and him trying to kind of reason and ration your rationalize your thoughts yeah yeah. yeah. Um, but no, it's been good. And if anybody was watching this and, and thought and was thinking about it, I would definitely advise it. And I think 
it's um like you said it's a safe space and it's a space where you can talk freely and and not be judged and if that's the only thing that comes from it if they don't give you any answers but you go it off your chest i think that's a good a good point as well i agree man and uh completely on board with what you're saying i've also i've also heard you say uh seen in that interview that you feel like the stuff that you do off the pitch um helps you on the pitch which is something mm. that I, I i really agree because um i feel like all my my hobbies or the st- things that i do on my spare time they kind of mm. like recharge me or they um, stimulate a different part of my brain or you know they, mm. they go hand in hand and as you well said in an interview uh, people think that to be an elite athlete or a professional footballer you have to be completely obsessed with football and that's the only thing you think about and mm. I, I really disagree with it and I'm and I'm and I'm very I, I was very happy like to see someone else that thinks in the in the same way because I feel like there's this mentality that 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 cannot work, you know, that you have to be focused, like as if you're a banker and you have to be thinking about, um, I don't know, the market the whole day, you know, it's, mm. it's very, and I get why football gets judged by that. But um, tell me, tell me why, why do you feel like that helps you as well? And, and what are the things that, you know, um, apart from football stimulate you and, um, and, you know, and keep you going and recharge you? Mm. Yeah. Well, it's a good question because, like, if 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 you and I were in like Sir Alex Ferguson's dressing room back in the day, there's no way that we would have been able to exercise our hobbies away from football so freely, mm. uh, because I think that was a culture that they had at the time where, uh, like Gary Neville, I think spoke about Jesse Lingard's clothing line and said that like, he should be focused on football. And I think when you're not playing well, that's an easy thing to pick up on. Or oh, what else is he doing? But that doesn't mean that it's taken away from your ability to play football. They, they might be completely separate. Mm-hmm. But the reason I think it, it helped me so much is because when I got injured is when I set up my first business. And business is what I really enjoy. And I came from a finance background. So I really enjoy property. I really enjoy finance. I really enjoy looking at markets. I really enjoy business. And I think at, at the time when I got injured, all I had was football. So... Mm-hmm. Football was the be all and end all of my life. Football was what made me happy. Football was what I did in my spare time. Football was what I did for my job. When I could no longer play football and that was taken away, I think I was like, well, well now what do I have in my life? I have no pillars of, of, of happiness, really. I don't, I don't have... I ended up spending money. I ended up drinking more. I ended up going out more. All things that were detrimental to me even getting fit again. So I think... People have so many different hobbies, and when when football drops down, you you should still be able to have three or four different things that really make your life complete, or make you happy, or bring you some form of satisfaction. And I think that's not a bad thing. And I'm I'm not necessarily talking about football anymore. I'm just talking about as a human, because people go to work and they come back and they have hobbies to take their mind off work. Because work is work, whether you play football, whether you work in an office, it's still work. And if it started off as a hobby, that's one thing. When you get paid for it, judged for it, and kind of battered for it, that <laughs> then becomes work. So yeah. I think we we sometimes get put in the category of, oh, well, I would love to be doing your job. So um, you should kind of act how I would act. But and, and also, I think there's two different kind of types of players. Like you said, some like Ronaldo, Messi, and I think even them, like Ronaldo, to become the first billionaire footballer, you don't get there just by focusing on football. You have other things going on. You have businesses going on. You 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 try and create a brand whilst you're playing. Um, Beckham was a great example of it. Obviously, he, he didn't necessarily set uh, businesses. Was Michael Jordan full of it? I think. People sometimes think that the only way to achieve greatness is if you submerge yourself in football 24-7. Mm. That's not necessarily the case. I just think if you're doing things that um, keep you mentally stimulated away from football, then when it comes to football, you're, like you said, more recharged, more refreshed, more aware of, of what's going on in the world, which also makes you a better person. Sure. I think, yeah, I think it's, it's dangerous. I genuinely think it's dangerous to just have football as a be-all or end-all because if that gets taken away from you through no fault of your own, 
whether it be an injury, car accident, coronavirus, and you're coming to the end of your contract. Like, they, and then what do you do? Yeah, for real. And also, like, I, I said it before that, um, you know, for quarantine, um, I'm not going to say that I was um, the happiest person in the world because obviously it is it was crazy what's going on, you know? And, and, and I felt so much for people that like have uh, been through like very difficult situations. Like for me, mm. the only thing that's happening is that I'm away from my family. But apart mm. from that, I'm so grateful and so privileged with what, what's going on. But at the same time, um, you know, I didn't have football, but I was very lucky that I had this, all these other things where that they could stimulate me and they still made me happy without having football. Whereas I feel like loads of footballers they didn't have that, you mm. know? And the only thing they have was like probably just their family and that's mm. it. And coming back to your point, um, loads of players and loads of people, when they get home, they're not, even though they're not setting up businesses or they're not, um, you know, expressing themselves in the way that probably we can be doing it, they're still probably with their family, they're playing with the kids, mm. they're picking them up from school, they're like, you know, putting them to sleep, all this stuff. They're not thinking about football, you know? Mm. It's basically the same. It's like, I'm just a single guy. I live alone. Like, what am I going to do? I have no one to take care of. So this mm. is my time for me to express myself in other ways, you know? People think that uh, most players, they get home and then, I don't know, they, they, they do train more or then they watch more things. <laughs> and like, sometimes you will do it because you will need to. And like, obviously, after games, you do reviews, you do all this stuff, but then, after three o'clock, you're home and you finish your day. You know, and people you, you also think that just because you finish training, people yeah. think that just because you finish training, you're you're home by like twelve. It's like oh, you only train like ten till twelve, <laughs> and then you're home by half twelve. And it's like it's just sometimes you don't leave the training ground till three, four o'clock. And yeah, whilst that's not a long day in terms of like other people's work, it is a long day when your job is so men when your job is so physically challenging because on a Saturday, we have to be physically prepared. It's not like, it's yeah. not like we could just sit down, at, sit down at a desk or um, go into a workplace and maybe hide for the day. Like if you're feeling down or if you're feeling not up for it, you could, you can try and stay away from your colleagues or you can try and stay away from your boss or yeah. stuff and like that. Also, I think. Yeah. It's also a 24 seven job, right? Being a footballer is something that you have to carry every single mm. time. If you work in an office or if you work in a restaurant or whatever, you finish your job and then you become you in your life. Mm. Whereas in football, mm. it's like if you're in the street, you have to behave mm. a certain way. You have to be an example with everything you do. You have to be healthy. You have to sleep well. You have to, you know, you are a footballer 24-7. Even mm. when you're at home behind closed doors, you're still being a footballer and you have to be. You're still training mm. in some ways, like the invisible training. Whereas like, I don't think people realize how, Im how important that is. And even though, as I can say, like, yeah, I'm home by two o'clock, but there's still so much that you're doing from like watching what you eat or from like watching, you know, mm. if, if you go to have a drink with your friends, maybe you cannot drink or maybe mm. you cannot do this or maybe they're all going out, but you have to go home and be home by 11 o'clock. You know, all these other things, you're still being a footballer when you're not at the training ground. And I don't think people realize how, how much importance we give to that and how much that also affects our life. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You can never, you can never not be Hector Bellerin and I can never not be Tyro Mings because if I'm, if I'm having a bad day or if I've had an argument with a family member or if training hasn't gone well or Aston Villa are going through a bad run of results and I pull up to a traffic light or I walk into a supermarket and somebody wants a picture, I can never just not be Tyro Mings. I have to be nice and welcoming because that person may never get another opportunity to to meet me and I don't want them to think oh he was an arsehole just because something that was going on in my personal life so yeah there's definitely it's definitely uh a 24-hour job but mm -hmm. at the same time it's, it's one that we also can give so much pleasure to so it, it definitely has its benefits and and uh, minuses but in terms of in terms of your career as a whole there are a lot more obviously highs uh, there are a lot more lows than highs mm. so i think well, you enjoy them more than the high you enjoy them more absolutely but i think that it just gives you a perspective on life and and it makes the things that you really are passionate about away from football even more important and how you have your uh, interior design company um mm. i heard you have like some investing in startups as well 
Um, mm. Was that uh, with interior design, uh, especially, uh, is the one that I, I, I like more about all, all the stuff that you're doing? Um, how, how, how did it? How did it um, come about? Because I know, like, you were into into um, like, what's it called? Uh, into houses and stuff. Like you, you were you were working yeah. uh, as a mortgage advisor and stuff. And um, how did it come about? Was it um, an idea that you had from early that you knew that you liked? Or kind of like the opportunity just came about and you went for it? Like, what was it? How was it for you? Yeah, so it was, it was literally the same time um, as when I got injured at Bournemouth. I signed for Bournemouth in, like, August. And then I set the company up in October. But between that, I signed that pre-season. I met with my business, my now business partner, but I went to school with her about, um, well... I last seen her about three years prior. So we left school at 16 um, and she went off to university, but she went to university down in Bournemouth and she was just finishing her master's degree in interior architecture and spatial design. And I'd just come out of working, like you said, as a mortgage advisor. So I knew all about buying and selling houses and the ins and outs of that and financing them. But I thought at one point I might get into property development. So I thought, well, I know about the buying and selling now I just need to learn about the interiors and kind of how to fit out houses and stuff. And I thought it's a, I like business. It's a great opportunity for us to get together and, and try something. And that was five years ago. So I put a bit of money into the company to start it and kind of like get us through six months and just see how things went and seeing if it was something that either had a need for down in Bournemouth or Katie, my business partner was um, really passionate about it or whether the business could actually grow without me being too involved because obviously I still have to play football. Yeah. And I mean, fortunately for the both of us, Katie is super knowledgeable and really skilled and technical in her work. Mm -hmm. um, and the business has just been uh, able to grow over the past five years to, to bigger and better things. I mean, we started naively. I think I started thinking, Oh, I will set up this interior design company. I play with a lot of players that have nice houses. I can probably tap into them and we can do some nice houses and then move on from there. And I don't think we've actually, I don't think for the first three years we did any footballers' houses. Um, we did, our first office, our first project was an office. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly we realised that there's more money to be made and a lot better projects to be doing in the commercial world rather than residential. So, we moved into commercials and since then we've done pretty much every commercial building or industry there is from nightclubs to restaurants to serviced offices to um, kind of buy to lets and yeah we, we, we're working with some property developers down in Bournemouth at the moment working on an aesthetics clinic I mean the company COVID was a difficult time obviously for every business but I think what it did was it flush it or it will eventually flush out kind of businesses that haven't been running so well over the past few years because they have cash flow problems and by the time they're allowed to work again which is about now they'll be thinking all right we'll get the phone back out because we've furloughed all our staff and then let's pick things back up but by that point we didn't have to do that because we didn't have many staff um I, we've never taken any money out of the business in terms of like dividends or anything. So every money, all the money we've earned, we've put back into the company. And it's just allowed us to, like we employed a sales manager um, from the 1st of June to kind of kickstart things even quicker and to get us back on our feet even quicker um, and to try and grow the business throughout this awful period. And I think that's worked so far um, over the last couple of weeks. It's been a bit lesson for us because he's really knowledgeable about the industry and the areas and stuff like that and, and he's worked with ATM um, on and off for, for about 12 months but we took him on as a full-time position on the 1st of June so yeah business and navigating your way through those problems are, are something I enjoy but I think it as sports players some of the characteristics that we have like obviously setting goals and overcoming obstacles and uh, looking for opportunities are all things that translate into the business world as well. So um, it's definitely it's definitely worked well. And yeah, the interior design business is what I'm most passionate about because that's the first company that I set up, and I guess it's like my baby in terms of business. Yeah, 
I feel you. I relate to you. Um, and how, how involved are you? Are you like creatively involved in it or are you just like kind of, um, you know, looking at it a little bit from the outside and just checking that everything's mm. fine? Uh, do you have an input? How does it work? I don't do any interior design and I would be lying if I would, I wouldn't even try and admit that I did any interior design. <laughs> I have, I have a, I have a great interest whenever I do anything personally. So like um, buying a house or looking at houses to buy or develop or whatever, I have a big interest and a keen interest on interiors there. But in terms of um, doing the work for the company, my business partner and she, and we have a couple of like um, interns that work for the company. Um, we have a, a woman that helps with Katie on the, on the design. So, I wouldn't want to get involved and I wouldn't want to say to Katie, oh, maybe we should be doing this because I feel like that would be her telling me how to play centre back or something. So <laughs> I just, I just let, I just let her get on with it. And then um, I'm involved really from in kind of strategy and oversight of the business, like yeah. what, what we're going to do next, where we want to take the business. We've had so many different ideas and um, kind of avenues that the business was going down at, at different points that were either, um, not quite right for us as a company or didn't have much longevity and on that we've kind of had to reassess and think all right maybe that's not going to work but maybe we can go in this direction and try this and it's just been like that really for five years and uh, I try and I try and go down and meet people when I can and schmooze them and if it makes them feel good then yeah, having yeah, a picture yeah. there with me and it gets them a bit more pressed in the paper and stuff then then that's where I can come in but no, I really enjoy the, bit, the bits that I can do, obviously time is time is a bit of an issue at times, but yeah, for sure. no, I, I really enjoy it. I do. That's good, man. And uh, also you have like your your football uh, school academy. Um, you, have, yeah. like, you have it in the Midlands and in the Southwest as well. And mm. um, not only that, you've, uh, you've been very vocal about the, all the charity stuff that you've been doing from like helping homeless people. And, um, you know, now you said that um, people that are family, uh, kids that are families uh, from key workers, they'll get like six weeks off on your academy and stuff. Mm. And also you said that that academy is coming at a loss uh, for you. Um, Mm. I think that all like great initiatives, man, and uh, being respectful for all of that. Um, And do you think that um, the fact that you as a footballer, you had a chance to actually see the real world um because me personally and like so many other players you know i I was a barcelona from six to eight um sorry from eight to 16 then i came to arsenal so i was always like kind of you know in big academies kind of thing and and many players Mm. do that as well they always they can be in the same academy till the first team but you got to experience what it was to be like a like a young adult and like having Mm. to get a job and like having to get a lift and get the bus uh, etc um, do you think that has had a big impact in in the way now you you use your platform and you use your money and and to give back? Mm, yeah, definitely. It's a good question. I think I think what it allows me to do is is when I'm I, I only try and get involved in in stuff like charities and, and stuff like that that I feel like I can talk from experience and, and whether it be mental health or underprivileged kids or um any different initiative that i can get involved in and and say listen i was like you once i i was in your shoes i think it adds more authenticity to what i'm saying and um and no disrespect to academy players like you said you came through the academy but some players are, are not aware of the situations that some of these players or kids or um maybe not not even footballers, but but just kids out in the community are going through because maybe they've never experienced it. And that's not a bad thing. I just think I've been there once. So if I can try and lend a little bit of a hand in terms of if I was a kid, what would I have liked? Like, yeah. I'd have loved to have gone to a football academy or, or I would have loved to have um, been able to talk or play or, or train with, with like a professional player. And obviously we started it off the academy down in Bristol and it's just somewhere where kids can go and, and train. And the, the coaches are really highly qualified and um, it's an environment where there's no pressure. Like we don't play games, so the players don't feel like, oh, if I don't train well, then I'm not going to get in the team. Because I think 
that's put on them from an early age at their club teams anyway. So yeah. coming away from that and thinking, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to let the team down, or I don't want to let my manager down, or I hope we win this weekend. Like all them stresses are just taken away by going and training in an environment where there's no pressure. And I think, um, yeah, it's been really good, and and that's been running for a few years now. And yeah, like you said, it, it costs money. I, I don't think been any years yet where it's where it's made money but I was aware of that going into it that that would be the case I mean that there are so many different things that we could do to make more money or to um, charge people more or or try and get people to buy more merchandise like like shirts and stuff but I think the whole the whole ethos of it and the values of the academy is is uh, to try and give back and to try and give back into the community where I feel like I can I can have an influence. I grew up in the Southwest. That's why they started there. And then when we came up to Aston Villa, there was a lot of demand for it um, to be brought up here. So that's been running. That's been running for about 12 months now, um, maybe just short of 12 months. And yeah, they're really good. I really enjoy getting down there when I can. I mean, over the next few months, it's not going to be too many opportunities to, mm-hmm. to get down, but I'm not even sure when we're going to be allowed back. But yeah, the NHS and key workers, kids that have been... Um, working throughout this period um, we'll have yeah, we'll have the opportunity to bring their kids down and I think the first term is about six weeks so um, that'll be free of charge just as like a little thank you sometimes as footballers it's like oh we can donate to the players together thing but we don't know where the money's going or we don't know who who's going to really benefit from it so it's just something that I could maybe do and, and try and help the local community that's so good man well done bro um, talking about like your your experiences that you've lived uh, outside of football or like getting into football. I want to talk about one that I want to tie with what uh, is going on right now. And it's your England debut that happened in, in Bulgaria. I think um, mm. you handled it really well and uh, loads of the players <laughs> did too. But also something that you did, which was uh, you were vocal about it. There's so many players on the pitch, not just professional, but not professional, that they don't talk about it. And um, they just uh, let it happen for different reasons. I think it was great that you did the way, what you did and the way that whole team responded um, as well. And um, it was your debut, right? And it was, uh, you said like you didn't let that uh, cloud your, your, your experience and, mm. and uh, your night. Um, but I just want you to tell me like, why was it? First of all, how was your experience? If it was the mm. first time that, that something like that happened to you? Um, and um, what was it important for you to, to talk about it and, 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 you know, to make everyone aware that, that that issue was going on then? Yeah, well, we had quite a lot of conversations before the game, like with the FA and with the manager and stuff in terms of if like, we're going into a situation where this might happen and if it does happen, this is what we're going to do. So I felt well equipped going into the game that I knew that if, if any of us were, were racially abused, um, what to do and what steps to take. So first of all, credit to the FA because I think they gave us a, a, a lot of preparation going into the game. Um, yeah, and, and ironically, what I said to the linesman, which was, did you hear that, um, was picked up on camera and then relayed back through the world whilst I was still playing. So I think that was quite poignant that um that happened i mean there's not many things that when you're playing gets picked up on camera um, yeah. or picked up on the microphone so the fact that that was i think was was great because yeah obviously i, I said to the linesman i could i could hear it and the linesman was stood 10 yards away from me so he must have been able to hear it yeah. um and i think that was one of the first steps of what you should do was to make the officials know or make your yeah. captain know so that was the first thing. Um, but yeah, the way we handled it was great and, and credit to everybody that was on the pitch and everybody that travelled with us um, because it brought us together and we had a conversation about it just before half-time. We had a conversation at half-time, like, are you guys okay um, with playing? Because there's no pressure on you to go back out. There's no pressure um, on you to finish this game. But we felt good. We felt strong as a group and we felt that... Um, at that point, it wasn't our responsibility to try and implement the, the sanctions. Um, we came over there with, with a job, which was um, to 
to play football, to play football against Bulgaria. And sometimes <clears throat> like the, the racist chants could be like they're not personal. When people get in groups and they shout things in groups, they're not personal. They're maybe, maybe even more politically driven. Um so now I look back on it with with, with good memories because Bulgaria is a lovely country and I don't think it's a country for the racists. I think we have racist issues that go on in this country, as we've seen in the past few weeks. So I don't have any negative is um, issues with the country. I don't have any negative issues with what happened what happened that night because, um, like I said, I don't take it personally. It was just an unfortunate thing to happen. But we can't sit here in England and say, oh, Bulgaria are awful because yeah, it's going on here and it's going on around the world. So. No. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, at that time, I think Bulgaria got like a 75k fine and um, two, a two match ban for the, uh, they had to play behind closed doors. Yeah. Um, also, the famous Raheem Sterling incident um, got the guy to be uh, banned for life from uh, Stamford Bridge. Um, do you think uh, football is doing enough against these things? And I'm not talking just like with the fans, I'm talking more of a global uh, level involving uh, players, clubs, uh, you know, fans, etc. Mm. Do you think um, they're doing enough? Do you think there's much more to do? And do you think now is 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 a good opportunity for for these organisations to to you know to get a better message across and to and to help change things? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, some of the sanctions in the past have been um, have been bad, really, because I think they could have they could have done a lot more. Um, but what's going on in the world at the moment in terms of like protests and campaigns and the awareness that's being spread around discrimination, either institutionally or systematically, I think is an important it's an important time for football, and it's an important time for society because without COVID. Um, and without um, George Floyd unfortunately losing his life I think these issues would have been parked and the football season would have finished and everybody would have gone on their summer and yeah. it would have taken something else further down the line to, to bring these issues up again so out of negative situations we can definitely see some positives in terms of what's going on at the moment but I think football I think football is 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 doing well I mean if you look at it in terms of other industries it has been progressive in terms of its fight against racism. There's no question about that. I think, um, like I said, some sanctions could have been better. But in terms of like the coaches that are, that are involved in like England age groups and stuff like that, there are a lot of black coaches around, um, and certain organisations are trying to change things. But what I don't think it has kind of moved away from is at the top level, like boardroom level and administrator level, I think we've still got a few a few years to go yet in terms of trying to get more diversity into those boardrooms and into those conversations because ultimately those guys are making decisions on behalf of ethnic minorities and behalf of black players. So mm -hmm. I think at the very least, you should be educated around those cultures. Um, and I think that's one step that could be a, a short-term goal, education courses, and really understanding the discriminations that go on at workplaces and really understanding um, different cultures around um, why there's less representation of different cultures in the game and how they can tackle that. I just think anybody that's involved in football should be trying to learn more about different cultures. And if you learn more about different cultures, you can make better decisions for them in the short term because the amount of... Um, ethnic minorities in boardrooms is such a small percentage if not nil yeah. um and if not you can and if if in the long term you can try and create a pathway to getting black ethnic minority people and ex-players or or anyone really into those conversations into those boardrooms and and really try and drive change but i definitely think that football is on the right course i mean it's easy to sit here and say oh you've got just white people in your office so you must be racist i don't think it's about racism i just think it's sometimes about ignorance i just think like us sitting here as male footballers we don't understand what goes on and how much discrimination women footballers get and women working in sport like if you haven't been exposed to it 
there's no reason why you really should know about it. But I don't think it's a racism yeah. problem. I just think it's I just think it's historically uh, ignorance. Yeah. But I think now people are talking about it, and I've had conversations from people in sport. I've had conversations with people high up in sport, saying like, "Oh my God, I feel so bad. Like, I just want to learn about what's going on with this movement and and." And what is it that people are campaigning for change? And what is it that people want to come from this? Obviously, I've never been experienced from it. I've never experienced it. I come from a good background. Like I've had a, a good upbringing. I, I don't know anything about it. And those conversations are, are like, good. Like, this is, what, this, is, this is what we want to happen. We just want conversations about it. We just want you to understand how we feel. Um, I don't think it will cause a divide. I think there's, there's a lot of political tensions at the moment in the outside world. In terms of sport, sport has a great way of unifying people, um, and I think I think that will continue to happen. It's just it's just brought it to people's attention a lot sooner, I think, um, and it's allowed us to have those conversations without them turning around and saying, "All right, yeah, let's just get the season out of the way and then we'll talk about it," like, stuff like that. Because the this, this football season is the be all or end all when you work in football. Yeah, yeah, no, I think. Um... Yeah, I think football has a massive part to play in society, mm. especially mm. In, in a country like the like the UK. Uh, we can see like also now some of the incidents um, that are happening of like far right groups, uh, you know, protecting um, <laughs> Churchill statue and stuff like that. A lot of people are linking that to football, um, to football mm. hooligans or like uh, firm culture, etc. But also I feel like, um, you know, football fans are not like that. You know, mm. football is uh, such a diverse industry. Like for me, I felt like, um, you know, I have so, so many people around me, especially in Spain, which I think is a country that is not as forward thinking as the UK is. And, um, you know, I've, I've been brought up with like diverse groups of people around me, you know, and for me, I think the fact that I was lucky enough to have that since young, it was never, um, not an issue for me. Uh, I wouldn't call it an issue, but it was never something that I thought about because for me, it was just so natural, yeah. you know? Yeah, but yeah. You said, now people that are saying like, oh, I had a good upbringing, but I don't know nothing about it. And I think that is the problem, right? That by having a good upbringing, you basically ignorant of like, how many other people are leaving and how yeah, many, yeah. Uh, you know, how people are suffering. And um, yeah, I feel football is, is a right, a great tool for people to, to look into and see like how us in our teams, you know, we, we literally uh, full of diversity and for us is, you know, how is this stuff happening? You know, mm. cause it's, it's so far fetched for, for us or for the people that I feel like around in my circle. Um, mm. So yeah, man, I think it's, it's great that people like you, uh, I think like a lot of young people in football have been vocal about it, which I think has been great. Uh, um, funny that you said like the, 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 the Ferguson culture, you know, kind of didn't allow you to kind of like say all these things. And now, mm. and now especially young footballers, um, with the platform that they have, they've raised and uh, they have a voice and, and they've used it for this. And I hope that there's more people now um, going to do the same and feeling inspired by this and really hope that there's more change to come um, with all that is happening, with all the protests. Um, I saw that you went to one of the protests. Um, mm. Well done for doing that, man. And um, yeah, I feel like we have a, a big part ourselves to, to play in this whole thing. Definitely. Definitely. And I think football, and like I said, it, it has a way of uniting people. Like, even with the amount of conversations that players from different clubs have been having um, and how diverse those phone calls are, it's like that's not represented higher up in the chain and like higher up in the boardrooms or administrator or executive level. So I think it definitely has a way to go. But um, I don't think football is an industry that doesn't like change. I think from over the years and more and more diverse players have come over and um, kind of 
different ethnicities have mixed together and the whole sport is very diverse. Mm-hmm. I think it just is just now a time where that diversity has to be reflected in kind of the areas of, of power. Yeah. Um, but saying that, like, us as players, like, the, the, a changing room doesn't allow you to discriminate or allow you to be racist or have any racist views because they are so diverse. And like you said, mm-hmm. it just doesn't even doesn't even cross your mind that it might be a problem or someone might be being discriminated against because, like, in the changing rooms, you're just like brothers and you work yeah. together every day and fight for each other and you fight against each other. Like, it's just it's just the culture that you're in and the environment that you're in. It doesn't allow itself to be like that. And I think that is something that football has done well, like brought on and brought on. And I think, like you said about the far right groups and, and um, the difference between politics and football and where they sometimes get involved in, in negative ways, I think, like you said, that is not a true representation of football fans. You can't link that to football just because they've got football tops on. That's not if they've got a club jersey on, if they had Aston Villa top on and they were fighting in London, that's not that's not a representation of Aston Villa. That's yeah. just a, that's just a small minority of people who feel like they they try and project their views and what is right in their head onto yeah. other people. And if you don't feel like I feel like we're gonna have a fight, like it's, it's <laughs> just a it's just a backwards and slightly old school mentality in terms yeah. of such diverse societies. Mm. Yeah, for real. And then just to um, to end this conversation, man, um, which I've really enjoyed, man. I I share lots of the points that you that you have, and um, it's great to listen to to all the stuff you had to say, man. And you said that you've been you've been reading a bit. There's only so much you can read, as you say. But um, what are you reading right now, man? I'm interested. Right, the book that I I finished not so long ago is actually propped up underneath this 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 laptop. Uh, it's called Relentless. Have you read it? No, never. Bro, Relentless by um, Tim Grover. Mm-hmm. He's the guy. Have you seen The Last Dance? I haven't watched it, no. Because everyone, everyone's <laughs> watching it, bro. And I'm like, <laughs> until the hype is dead, I'm not watching it, bro. <laughs> oh, bro, I'm with you. I've not seen one episode. I know what happens. And I know, yeah, I know about that's it. it. We know. We know what's going on, yeah. When there's like when we're back into away games and we're in hotels, that's when you watch it, and that's, that's when I watch time. it as well, bro. But he is um he worked with Kobe Bryant um all throughout his career. Obviously, last night's about Michael De- uh, Michael Jordan, but he also uh, features in that. A guy called Tim Grover. He's an athletic performer. And he talks about like, what it takes to get to the top. And if you read his book. Nowhere in there does it say set up businesses. Nowhere in there does it say focus <laughs> on social media. Nowhere in there does it say. Uh, if you're interested in fashion, go into that. It just says, listen, he, Kobe, MJ were up at four or five in the morning, six in the morning. When the game finished, they were hitting the gym. And it's like, they're just one example. Like, you're talking about Michael Jordan. He created one of the biggest businesses in the world whilst mm-hmm. playing and, and made, got that endorsement deal whilst he was playing. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Another book, another book to read if you're gonna if you're gonna take anything from this conversation is called Ego is the Enemy. Oh, it's such a good book, man. Maybe is the best book I've ever read. Really, I I read I read a very like on the subject. It's called The Untethered Soul, um, which is yeah, basically just to like Untethered Soul. Untethered Soul. Yeah, it's 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 a very good uh, book that. Um, it's kind of different to like all self-help books or like psychology books that I've read before. Yeah. I don't read many of them. I used to when I, when I started, because um, I had a coach that was really into psychology of football. And I yeah. uh, it was when I was like 16, 17. But um, yeah, it just talks about a lot about the ego and how like detrimental that is to your personality. And like, yeah, yeah. You know, there's like the detachment from your voice in your head to like who you really are and stuff. And it's just like really 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 interesting and i think like once you kind of yeah put your ego aside if there is even or, or you kind of get rid of it there's like you open like such a big door of like yeah definitely opportunities and feelings and things that are just you know you were so close to before so it's it's such an interesting subject yeah was it ego is the enemy ego is the enemy yeah it's by a guy called ryan holiday uh okay. he's a american guy but it's not as deep, like it doesn't go too scientific. Yeah. It's just a lot of things that you read and you're like, yeah, 
um, that you can put into place or you can mm-hmm. kind of resonate with you like, in the workplace or you think, yeah, I'm probably, I'm probably guilty of doing that or, um, but no, it's, it's, it's really good. I found it really good. It's not necessarily self-help. It's, yeah. it's probably less, less uh, scientific or, or intrusive than the title sounds, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a really good book. Nice, man. Well, bro, uh, I have to say, man, I really enjoyed this, bro. It was, it was great to hear. Uh, me too, man. Me too. Thank you. Yeah, no, and uh, bro, I relate to so much stuff that you're saying and it's hard to find someone, you know, in the same industry with like uh, so many similar views and uh, especially I think for us in the circle that we are, people are so close and then yeah, yeah, yeah. it's difficult to open up and uh, to talk about the things that they're doing and, you know, to actually show that they're not, not like Michael Jordan, that they woke up at five in the morning <laughs> to do more gym. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure people are really going to enjoy this. And uh, yeah, bro. Take care Thank and you, be well. Bro. Yeah, I will see you soon. <laughs> Take care, Bye, bro. Thank you very much. Thank you. You too, man. Bye, bye.